think of Roy McGregor, uh, I think of a man who learns through the soles of his feet and through the palms of his hands, but who can take that experiential knowledge that's gained in an honest way at kitchen tables and with his, his, the calluses on his own hands, and he's turned that into a canon of writing that is not only spectacular, I think it stands above just about any other body of literature by one Canadian writer. And I'm including here Alice Munro and uh, Margaret Atwood. Roy tells us who we are, and he's done that in a way that's incredible. To have you here this morning, Roy, is a great joy. And now we're going to just really start chewing at this book. Andy, the front of this book, this fabulous book, is a, is a painting by, uh, by Tom, or Ken Danby, a guy who died in a long time. Did you know Ken? I mean, why did you put this on the cover? Uh, well, I know him just a little bit. Uh, I played in a, a charity hockey game that Ken Dryden and I arranged in Toronto, and Ken Danby came over to play. So I didn't know him well, but admired him hugely. And uh, the first cover that they put together of the book had the famous painting by uh, Francis Ann Hopkins of going over the, the Matawan Rapids, which you've seen on so many new books. And uh, I remember looking at that, and my wife Ellen looked at it too, and we felt that it sent the wrong message. It's a beautiful painting, don't get me wrong, I love her, her painting, but it just wasn't the kind of book I was hoping to do. And then somehow they found this painting, I haven't seen it before, and I'm doing a series called The Rivers of Canada, went out to uh, Calgary, and went up to the White Museum at Banff. They were having a special display on about water, and I turned the corner, and the very first corner I turned, I'm standing facing this, this exact same painting. This is only, what, three or three weeks ago or so. Wow. So, McGregor. Rob Roy McGregor, uh, founder of recreational canoeing, um, took religious tracts across Europe and became uh, known, and as we look back from Canada to rec through the sort of roots of recreational canoeing, we get to a guy called Rob Roy McGregor. Um, his actual name was John, but Rob, there was another Rob Roy McGregor who was sort of like the Robin Hood of Scotland. Yes. was one that started in the Empire Hotel in, uh, in Huntsville, where I think I might have had my first illegal beer. When I was in so, yeah, my mom and dad took me it's there. pretty old. <laughs> you served there. <laughs> but uh, you talk about your dad, Duncan, yes. uh, moseying down the road from your home in, uh, in Huntsville and, uh, and going to the Empire Hotel. But that story in your book leads to speculation about a relative who was involved in a canoe caper in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an amazing story, one of many in here. Can you just sketch out, I thought it was ingenious <coughs> how you sort of drew this connection, this personal connection that started in a point in Northern Ontario. Next thing you know, we're in Africa. Uh, tell us a bit about how you found that story and why it ended up in this book. Well, I I'm one of those people who believes Canadian history is fascinating rather than boring. Uh, I, 
came across this book uh, many years ago about the Canadians on the Nile. And it reminded me and my uh, brothers that our father always maintained that a relative called Jack Carson had gone off in the Nile expedition in 1884-85. But nobody knows anything about this. There may be some people that ring the room a bell, or maybe somebody who knows a lot about it. But most Canadians, 99%, know nothing about this. But what happened was uh, there was a famous general called Gordon, uh, General Charles Gordon, who was known as Chinese Gordon. And he was under siege in the car in Khartoum in 1884-85. The uh, there was a, an uprising, and it was very much like what's going on in Syria these days in Iraq. So that you have this Muslim, uh, very fanatical organization trying to kick the Egyptians out of the Khartoum area, and also the Brits. The Brits were very concerned because the canal had just opened, the Suez Canal. And it was just open, they didn't want to have any problems with it, but they also <coughs> didn't want to be involved. A bunch of pressure was put on by the media in London, and the, the Prime Minister at the time, Gladstone, caved in and said, okay, we're going to go and try to rescue Gordon, because he's surrounded, he sent back his messages, he's in deep, deep trouble. And he's going to be killed, and the people love him, even though he was a nutcase. The people in England absolutely adored this man. And so they assigned Viscount Wosley to the, to the task of getting Gordon out. Wosley, 15 years earlier, had been stationed in Canada. And in the 1870 uprising in Manitoba, the Red River Rebellion, it was he who went out there and put it down. It also led to, as we know, the formation of Manitoba as a province. It was a very key moment. Uh, the formation of the RCMP came out of that. And how he got there was he lined up a bunch of Mohawks and a bunch of uh, river guys from around the Ottawa Valley area, and they went up through the Red River, the Winnipeg River and that, and they did it by canoe. Wosley was so impressed by the canoe ship and how quickly they'd been able to travel that he had this idea that we can send these same voyageurs into Khartoum up the, up the Nile, Nile River and they can save Gordon. So he got permission to do this. It was Canada's first engagement in the, in the world at large. I've completely forgotten about a military engagement. Johnny and McDonald looked at it with horror and said, Well, okay, you can do whatever you want, just don't, we're not paying for it. And the <laughs> Governor General Lansdowne got involved, so they said, Well, we'll get these guys together. Only there was a hitch. There were no voyageurs left by that time. They kind of, 15 years, and it kind of erased them. But they did have all these Ottawa Valley bloggers, and, and it was, they were looking for them at the end of August. And these guys had nothing to do. So they were waiting for the winter to come, they could start cutting the wood and drawing it. They were offered 40 bucks a month to go to this place they'd never heard of, Egypt. Save this person they'd never heard of, Gordon. They signed up in droves. They got some Mohawk Indians, but mostly these were river guys from the Ottawa Valley, and some bank clerks from Winnipeg who didn't even know how to pack. <laughs> 386 of them. They gathered, a couple of hundred gathered in Ottawa, there's a photograph taken of them in front of the Parliament Bill. They, they were to get together to take the train to Montreal. They get hammered that night. <laughs> Some of them don't even make the train. They get to Montreal. They get drunk in Montreal. Some of them get lost again. They sound like voyagers. Yeah. <laughs> they got on the ship. Of the canoe to see <laughs> ship to its docks at Quebec City. And the governor general's there and several residents. He comes out and gives this marvelous speech to them about how you're going to be representing your country at large. You've got to behave because you're going to form the international impression of what Canadians are all about. No problem. They get drunk again. They stop walking <laughs> at Sydney to, to refuel and take on food. They get so drunk they lose some of their guys again. One of the one of the uh, boy boyers we call them. The, he goes into the uh, School, he starts lecturing, he pushes the teacher out of the way, he starts lecturing the kids about life and that, and the police come, he punches the cop out and knocks the guy out of gold. They get back. By the time they reach Liverpool, and then subsequently uh, they're, they're on their way to Alexandria, they're met by armed guards who won't even let them go get off the ships. <laughs> <laughs> they're so uh, afraid of these crazy Canadians. They built these special canoes. And, and the Canoe Museum, bless its heart, says that these were kind of canoes, even though they were very much a variation. They looked more like a Boston whaler, I guess, than a canoe. They called them canoes and that. And they put the Canadians where they took two birch bark canoes as well over for scouting. They get to the Nile, and they behave magnificently. They're, so, they're fabulous at what they do. 
They do their very best, but they don't get there in time. And, and Khartoum falls, and Gordon dies, and that. they're sent back. Most of them come back in ribs and drafts. And they come back, and they're given this parade on <laughs> Wellington Street in, in Ottawa, in which they've got uh, cockatoos on their shoulders, and a couple of them are hairy monkeys. They all got these great <laughs> scimitars, and they're waving. <laughs> <around. laughs> this happened in Canada, and no one has ever heard about it. So that there's a plaque on the Ottawa River right now. You can go and look at it. And it mentions Wolseley, it mentions Lansdowne, it mentions Gordon and that, and it says, and 386 Canadians. <laughs> Not a name, nothing. The, the listing is so bad about who was on the trip down that you can't even be sure who went on. Did Jack Car Carson actually go? I found a Jack Carson who may have been a relative from Round Lake Center, who would have been the right age, but there's no record of him having gone. It's all gone, it's all lost, and it's, it's a movie. <laughs> Listen, uh, we probably should get this out there. Uh, you're, uh, you opened the book by talking about the wonders of Canada, the uh, CBC radio. Sheila Rogers, our ambassador of Mars, was actually, I think she was with Sounds Like Canada at the time. It was her, her idea to identify the wonders of Canada. And of course, as a result of Ray McGuire from Trooper and Roberta Jameson and you were the three, three judges deciding what um, what uh, the wonder should be, you came up with a group that included the canoe, but um, the canoe would not have been on that list were it not for you, Mr. McGregor. And I understand that, uh, at least it says so in your book, that uh, you underwent a death threat uh, from the people of Thunder Bay who were some peace that, uh, that is that, is that true? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I liked it. I said it over there when you talked about my fact-filled books. That's the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, what happened was that you know, we live in such a funny country, and, and we're obsessed with being politically correct. And I'm sitting there thinking, God, you know, this is being put on by the CBC, but it's about places, so they're going to end up being geographically correct. I know it. I can see it coming. So what can I defend that doesn't have a location? And I started thinking. And I, and I thought, wow, the, the canoe, no Canada, no canoe. We, I mean, we, I, I'm not the first to say that, James. You've said it. I thought that we, uh, John Jennings is, is here. He said that Canada made, was made by a canoe, basically. And I thought, you can find it anywhere. It has no location. It pertains to everything. And it covers Aboriginal uh, exploration, trade, recreation, everything you can imagine. So I started arguing in favor of that. But in order to get the, it whittled down to the top seven, we had to get rid of some. The number one vote that came in, there was more than a million votes, the number one vote was for the sleeping giant of Thunder Bay, and like 200,000 votes or whatever. And I was the voice kind of the deep six to <laughs> So I put the canoe in, killed the, killed the giant. As well, my emails <laughs> just exploded. People from Thunder Bay, and it just so happened I had to go to Thunder Bay a month later. <laughs> so Helen and I were going up there. And I get an email saying, if you show up at Thunder Bay, we're going to basically kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so I showed up there, and one television crew and one reporter was there. And I tried to explain it that. And they were so nice about it that by the time I left, a counselor had come and presented me with a painting of the Sleeping Giant, so I would never forget. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's Canadian, too. That's so, so Canadian. Okay, so the book's called Canoe Country, The Making of Canada. Fair enough, great title. You go to the chapter called The Craft, yeah. and it's set in Saranac Lake, New York, yeah. with the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association, um, arguably an American organization. Are you trying to make a point? Uh, no, 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 I just wanted to go to the Adirondacks. <laughs> That's how journalism works. I saw that this thing was going on down there, and I was going to get to it. I didn't want to make too much about the craft because it's not something I'm good at. I couldn't make, I couldn't even carve a child's paddle. So, so I, but I thought this is a good chance to, to, to go down and talk to some people and to see something and to have a little summer visit down in Adirondacks. And I got it into McLean, or into the Globe and Mail, which gave me a column to get me by for the week. <laughs> you know, I'm being very, very honest here. It was just a selfish move. <laughs> Your, your honesty is just totally disarming. <laughs> but if, if you were to draw a line around 
canoe Ophelia, who loves canoes, and, and the, the southern boundary of that would not be the 49th parallel. That's pretty, pretty sure. Or well, if they buy books. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the question, and we've wrestled with it at the Canoe Museum a lot, so there are canoes all over the world. I mean, yep. the maritime history begins with a, a log and a, that got pointed on both ends and eventually hollowed out. It doesn't matter where you go. Yeah, that's, that's where maritime history starts, and it works its way up to sloop rigs and parking teams and eventually to space shops. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm going to be Are you with me, Roy? <laughs> <laughs> it's like what a massive want? flashback. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. Actually, cool, oh, yeah. Okay. The question is, uh, Canadians have a particular affection for canoes, and that's true, but how much can we claim? Uh, the canoe, like what is the connection between canoe and Canada that is different for us than it is for those people in Saranac Lake who love canoes, or in Minnesota, or in uh, Polynesia, or in New Zealand, or in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, all of whom have canoes. What, what's different about uh, our affection for or our craft uh, 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 that you might reckon? Well, okay, I'm going to be honest here. I once read a I wish fabulous book. Fabulous book by Bill Mason by a guy, Raph, something. <laughs> and, uh, there was a quote in there that said, first God made the canoe, and then he made a country to go with it. And I'm not so sure you can apply that same uh, kind of silly criterion to the, those other crafts. Had there not been a canoe invented by the aboriginals of northern North America, they could not have survived. They could not have hunted. They could not have moved with the whatever they were following. If after Champlain came, he realized he couldn't get past the Lachine Rapids until he saw the Aboriginal, Aboriginals have deftly, they were able to move through the rapids. So the Europeans started adapting that style of canoe and allowed them to do the exploration. Uh, exploration led to the fur trade. Fur trade is basically what, when you combine the, the formation of confederation with the Hudson Bay Company and that kind of vast terrain that was later taken over only because of the <coughs> settlement, uh, certainly in uh, Huron Tract, uh, Muskoka, all of those areas, even to a certain degree in the prairies because of the canoe. Uh, they, they have this reason, uh, Sir John A. Sells, BC, on the idea of they'll join the country by train, but the reason it was able to be joined was because you have Manitoba canoe again. And uh, so I truly believe that it's, it's in our DNA and I believe it's in our psychology. And, and the reason that it persists so much, you know, we have a million canoes in this country now, and I know kayaking is hugely popular, I know paddle boards are popular, and we don't have any resentment toward that because it's still that essential paddling, right? And I think it's inside us, that it's, it's how we escape, it's how we reconnect, it's how we hopefully connect to First Nations and maintain that connection. And I mean, uh, I think it's one of the reasons I love the Canoe Museum so much. And I, get, I got so excited last night looking at those five different uh, examples of what might be possible here in Peterborough. And I, like I was saying, telling some of you people earlier, I've spent some time each year pretty well in the last five or so gone out to Winnipeg and I've looked at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights as it's been constructed. A lot of people thought it was a purely silly idea and it's a tough sell. I mean, who doesn't feel good about the Canoe? <coughs> It is, it's tough to feel good about some of those human rights issues. Yet, that museum is fantastic. It's put Winnipeg on the map in a way that it never was before. And it's a profound experience to go and visit it. Why would it be any different here? With something that you're already feeling good about and describes our country. I can honestly see that the, the Canoe Museum, any one of those five, would be perceived to be one of the greatest things in this country. And so. Canoe is still important. We think so too. <laughs>
and they're watching a, a game, uh, a hockey game at the Forum, and the Habs are playing somebody else, and they, you know how they zoom around to the various things and the people in the audience, and it zooms into seats right behind the, the Montreal box, and there are two guys in the frame, and the kid in the living room says, who's that guy sitting beside Bill Mason? <laughs> Pierre Trudeau. So it's actually a true story. It was a living room of, uh, uh, it's a Candelor, Camp Candelor connection. Wendy Grader and Fred Lucemore, who bought uh, Camp Candelor from Kirk Whipper with uh, Jack McGregor and Ev, his wife. It's and true. Uh, they adopted a boy, a boat boy from Vietnam called Quan Van Pham, who's done splendidly. But this kid was, he got off the boat at about, I think he was 12 when he came. Yeah. And uh, he was totally cultured into canoeing, and he's the one who had no idea who Pierre, Pierre Trudeau was. <laughs> but he, he knew exactly who, who Bill Mason was. But uh, dare we tread into this territory? Uh, I mean, John Turner told me that liberals catch their fish and conservatives inherit theirs. <laughs> Trudeau the Younger. Uh, I think it was Paul Wells in McLean's last week had a, a comparison of father and son. And uh, the father looks uh, decidedly uncomfortable in a canoe. I mean, yes, he was a child of nature and, and was loved canoeing and paddled. And this, he, I mean, he's known for that. But I thought just the two images around the essay comparing father and son, I thought Justin looked far more comfortable in a canoe. He's quite good. Than his dad. And uh, uh, what... Uh, what are you thinking about uh, as you see uh, Trudeau the Younger uh, move uh, into this position of, uh, of leadership in the country? Does wow, I didn't expect this right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spent an entire day with Justin a few years back when he started making his moves for politics. And he was then about 30 seven or so. And after spending the day with him, he reminded me of a child that had just gone off to university and was back home Thanksgiving for the first weekend. And so full of the possibilities of the world, and yet naive in the ways of the world. And I, I, I was concerned about that. But other things that I noticed about him was that he was kind to every single person that he encountered. It didn't seem to matter what station of life they might have been in. Uh, he was thoughtful. He listened, and uh, there was a decency to him that I, I really liked. So I put those two things together, and when this past election began, I thought, I don't know, I, I don't have high expectations. Like I thought once the grind began, that he would uh, either collapse or struggle at least. Mm -hmm. And so now the analysts are, not, are saying that it was because of these low expectations that we feel that he has done so well. And I certainly am among those who, who think that, regardless of your political persuasion, he has had a better election than the others. And so uh, I guess from that you might draw the conclusion there's still potential for growth there. And do you have to be that smart uh, to lead? Uh, don't forget how smart Trudeau was, and, and we are living in a part of the country where Trudeau is still hugely <coughs> admired. You just go out west, and it's, the animosity is still there in space. And if you've noticed now in the last few years, more and more American commentators are, are saying that Ronald Reagan is going down in history as one of the great presidents of all time. Do we forget that when he became president, we scoffed at him and thought he was you know, just an actor and like not even a very bright one? So it's a fair question. Do you have to be that smart to do well in politics? But I do, uh, I mean, not in the name of any kind of balance, but uh, you've had the uh, somewhat remarkable opportunity to work with uh, Stephen Harper on his book about hockey. And uh, uh, recently you had an opportunity, you actually wrote a column about Harper and his fishbowl. But uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you maybe understand the sensibility of paddlers, I mean, what, what do you know about Stephen Harper that you learned through that hockey book that... Uh, that those of us who uh, love the wilderness, love canoes, and love culture, 
what, what, are we, what, what do you know about Stephen Harper that you learned through the process of working with him to create what has been a very successful <coughs> book um, that you might want to share with us? Well, I, I guess I can. No, I, was, I always said I wouldn't share anything, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Who cares now? <laughs> Actually, he had a bit to do with this book because uh, I used to, I, I'd go down and wait outside his office and the Prime Minister of the country is kind of busy so he doesn't always come in time. And I would sit in a chair and right opposite me, like they moved paintings around in Parliament Hill. And so they had the Francis Hop and Hopkins painting on the matter wall right in front of me. I just sat there for days staring at it and I, that was when I was thinking about doing the canoe book. And then I went in and uh, Oh, he didn't like me at all. But uh, he didn't, uh, doesn't like the media. And then I thought, well, I'll never see him again. I was just went out of curiosity anyway. And then I got called back down. And I dealt with a man called Nigel Wright all the time. <laughs> First rate. And uh, so, but eventually, and there were so, so many oddities to it. Like, I'm trying to talk to him as an editor. And I'm talking about the narrative of a book all the time. And every time I use the word narrative, I can see his back book. And it took me weeks before I figured out that narrative, like some words lose their meanings. Narrative in Ottawa has completely lost its meaning. Narrative now means the lie. So the liberal narrative, and you hear it on television all the time, right? Well, that's the liberal narrative, and that's the NDP narrative. And that. They're talking about spin. So it become, it's, it's a word that means spin now. And I finally, I, I talk about the, how the art of a story has to go there. And finally, and I stopped using the word narrative. <laughs> so we started getting along pretty well uh, uh, after a while. And, and he, at one point he said to me, he said, uh, uh, would, you, uh, would you at all consider writing the foreword to this book when it's done? I said, I'd certainly be, be honored to write the uh, foreword to the book, as long as you don't mind me signing it, Senator Roy McGregor. <laughs> Right. 
And so as a reader, I come to this. Uh, it was the uh, uncorrected proof that I, that I read. But I'm going through this thinking, OK, it's a character. And then I read the, uh, the review in the uh, Globe and Mail. Uh, same, <laughs> same guy uh, read the book and said, OK, the canoe is a character. Mostly in a book, and you know, if having written fiction, you learn about the, uh, the sort of ancestral roots of the character. You learn about the, the, where the character came from. And uh, that reviewer was surprised that uh, you didn't say more in this book about canoe country about the indigenous ancestors or where the canoe came from. I know from reading your other work, notably Chief, your biography of Billy Diamond, and also your connections with the Round Lake Band and you know all kinds of indigenous people across the country. Um, I, I mean, it's not often you get back to get a chance to kick back at reviewers, and I'm, I want to open that for you now, having written that, that piece in the Globe and Mail. But it's a serious question, Roy, about um, the choices you made here for us to understand. Because as we go forward with the Canadian Canoe Museum, we're looking to configure the museum in the best possible cultural circumstance, and we're reaching out more actively than we ever did to the First Nation communities. And I thought that was a, a, a significant um, gap in the book, and uh, I wanted a chance to talk with you about it because I suspect with the depth of your knowledge about Canada and about its peoples and how it all works, that you made choices that ended up with the constellation of stories that are here and, and consciously uh, left out some elements of, of the sort of early days of this character called the canoe. Consciously, uh, I, I don't think any book is perfect. And I don't, I particularly don't think any book that you write is perfect. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> if you, no, I don't mean it that way. If you, uh, like I would never read one of my own books. <laughs> I, 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 know what you I can't stand reading my own stuff. So when I, uh, as I say, I tried to make it as a character. So I, there were things I wanted to stay away from. I wanted to stay away from craft because there have been some great books written on craft. I wanted to stay away from, I, there's not a word in there about Olympic canoeing, for example, not a word. Uh, there's not a word, much of a word in there about other forms of canoeing, which to me aren't canoes, but they always list them all together. And uh, the lar largest chapter in there is about the James Bay Crees and how they, they took their, from their original birch bark canoes, tried to move toward a better canoe. So that's the biggest chapter in there. There's lots of other reference there. Is it flawed? I'm not sure. But uh, that reviewer can go to hell. something like, there's more vomit in this book than there is in all of Canoe Lake. <laughs> <laughs> like, what kind of mean mind would you And that, that, that hurt, but eventually. You know, and I, I mean this, you'll understand this, most people don't read the whole review. Your, your point was made at the end of your review. <laughs> My publisher thought the review was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> James Rapp and rollicking good read. That's, that's what they look for. Publishers can't read either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we have a unique opportunity here in this, this audience. I, I mean, one of the great, many great chapters in your book is uh, Voices on the Des Moines River. And uh, you, you paint the picture of these uh, two characters, the Chester brothers, uh, Lauren and, and Phil Chester. And I was completely charmed by the chapter, but completely uh, delighted when I see that the men in question are here uh, this morning. So in the chapter, I mean, Phil has been whining about, uh, uh, Phil, the great poet from the Ottawa Valley and Paddler, um, has been telling the Canadian Canoe Museum that we need to have a, an exhibit on Grey Owl. And uh, we've been corresponding with Phil about that. And whether we need pretender exhibits uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, is a whole other matter. But uh, in, in that chapter, you paint a picture of these brothers 
who uh, love the wilderness, who are very capable canoeists, and who are kind of, it's a kind of a, a, a fresh take on something that we all know very well, but you sculpted a chapter about these guys. But in there, as you're talking about the possibility of a, or Phil's complaint about our museum not having an exhibit on Archie Bellany, you said, I think we should have an exhibit about the Chester Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would that exhibit look like, Roy? Right over there. <laughs> Well, you called them the Bob and Doug McKenzie of canoeing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never met these. <laughs> well, I'm going off, i got a paddle at Des Moines, you're way back in the wilderness there. And we get back finally, we're ready to start, and they take me aside. Go for a little walk. And they want me to change my name. <laughs> concept, and it may not have come from him, but uh, the all-Canadian tool is something we'd like to give you as a, uh, as a symbol of our affection for you, and, uh, and also as our vote of thanks uh, for you, who is probably more connected to Canada through hockey and canoes uh, than anybody we know. So thank you for coming, and uh, please come again, and uh, many thanks thank for this morning. This morning. <laughs>